I first met Chief Justice Marshall through her words in the Goodrich decision, which GLAD won in 2003. At that time, I was actually a new associate in San Francisco, still figuring out what I wanted to do with my law degree. But for one afternoon, in November 18th, instead of billing clients, I read her landmark decision, which included this profound yet simple constitutional principle. The Massachusetts Constitution affirms the dignity and equality of all individuals. It forbids the creation of second-class citizens. Those words, those words inspired me to pursue a career in LGBTQ rights. They are the words that allowed me to marry my husband in Massachusetts, the first state to allow us to do so. And they are the words that sparked a revolution that led the US Supreme Court to declare in 2015 that the fundamental right to marry could no longer be withheld from same-sex couples. But no single decision can characterize the totality of any judge's career, especially one as long and impactful as the Honorable Margaret Marshall. In fact, would you believe that Chief Justice Marshall has actually penned other decisions in fact, hundreds of decisions that have strengthened our constitutional values, advanced justice, and impacted the lives of so many who have been deemed other by society. Indeed, Chief Justice Marshall's life work has been animated by the idea that the law can be a powerful tool for including those who have been deemed other into the folds of our common humanity whether they have been people living with disabilities, criminal defendants, or low-wage workers, Chief Justice Marshall's body of decisions collectively call out the principle that second-class status not only cannot be tolerated within a constitutional democracy, it is destructive to the health of our democratic institutions. Informed by her days as an anti-apartheid student leader in South Africa, to her experiences as a new immigrant in this country, Chief Justice Marshall has never lost sight that we all share a common humanity and dignity. Now, beyond her steadfast commitment to individual rights, Chief Justice Marshall has worked to ensure that our judiciary works for the people who entered the courthouse doors seeking help. A longtime advocate of access to justice for all, she implemented innovative procedures for pro se litigants and strengthened pro bono services. She's recognized as a champion for an independent judiciary and as a leader in administrative reforms within the courts. Now, it may not make the headlines, but Chief Justice Marshall recognized that in order to strengthen society's faith and trust in the judiciary, our courts must run efficiently and effectively to serve the people's needs. And finally, having broken numerous barriers throughout her career, including being the first female Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Chief Justice Marshall has been a thoughtful advocate for greater diversity on the bench in all of its forms, not simply because diversity of experiences and perspectives strengthens judicial decision-making, but also because a diverse bench inspires a new generation of lawyers to pursue judicial careers. It is with immense honor that I present ACS Lifetime Achievement Award to the Honorable Margaret Marshall.
So, I said to my great friend, Corby Kummer, who's sitting at the head table, tough act to follow, Dahlia Lithwick. He said it's impossible. So thank you, Dahlia, for making my task so much harder. Um, and I have to say, this is a fantastic award for me to have. It really is, for reasons that I hope that I can explain. But people to get a lifetime achievement award, either I'm dead or I'm about to die. <laughs> but I hope I still have plenty of energy. I want to say that any society, this society that believes that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people has got to be just a great honor for me. And I want to thank Carolyn Fredrickson, my um, fellow awardees. The way we treat children in this country is abominable. I do not refer to anybody as a juvenile. I refer to them only as children. Uh, it helped. Um, but I will take this privilege. I am a lot older than the people we have listened to so far. And my history is a little longer. And so I want to remind you a little bit about the United States when I first arrived here. So I speak to you tonight as an immigrant, and I proudly hold that title. <clears throat> it was March 1968. I remember the month as if it were yesterday. I had left South Africa and arrived in Cambridge alone. The first day I walked along Massachusetts Avenue near Harvard Square. The street was gray and shabby. It had no charm. There was a biting cold wind. The temperature was below freezing and buses belched their way past me. It was before any EPA was even thought about and I picked my way through small piles of frozen black grime, snow, somebody said. <laughs> and I remember how dirty it all looked, how noisy it was, and I felt achingly lost. This new place to which I had come provoked in me the most painful, loneliness and hopelessness that I have ever known. Two days before, I had left one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Cape Town, a glistening jewel at the tip of Africa, a mountain rising from the sapphire sea, gentle breezes, warm sunshine. Beautiful South Africa was my home, the place of my birth, my family, and my friends. But South Africa had a dark and terrifying side to it. I had spent the preceding years leading a student movement that confronted the racism and brutality of apartheid. And at that time, the heavy boot of the government crushed its opponents ruthlessly, just as South Africa grew stronger, its economy more robust, its military capabilities unrivaled on the African continent. And I, a white woman, came to fear a knock on the door in the middle of the night, and I was not safe. But what had drawn me to this country? There was much more about this new place that made me anxious. Shortly after my arrival in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And in South Africa, a few of us had listened to a forbidden tape recording of a speech of his, with one ear listening always for the footsteps of the dreaded secret police. Dr. King spoke about individual rights which were promised in the United States. Now Dr. King was assassinated, and parts of Los Angeles and Chicago and Capitol Hill burned through the night. Three months after my arrival, on June 6, 1968, 50 years ago, Senator Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. Senator Kennedy had visited South Africa, invited by my student organization, and he had brought a message to us, a message from the United States of equality, 
of the dignity of all people. And I had come to his country, and now he too had been gunned down. Was our student invitation to Senator Kennedy a useless gesture? A white politician from a faraway land who nobody knew about. I was with Senator Kennedy when he spoke at the University of Cape Town on June the 6th, 1966, two years to the day before he was assassinated. And listening to him that evening in Cape Town has had a lifelong impact on me. Kennedy recognized how my fellow white students and I could feel, overwhelmed by the awesome power of the apartheid state, by the smallness of our acts, by the seeming futility of our gestures. And he spoke to us about that. The danger of futility, he said, is the belief that there is nothing one man or woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery and ignorance, injustice and violence. And then Kennedy spoke the words that I have never forgotten. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, of energy and daring, and each build upon a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I speak to you as one who has learned that democracy takes a long time to build, longer to nurture, and great courage to maintain. Decades passed between Kennedy's speech in South Africa and the release of Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners from prison. Futile gestures by students at a time when the overthrow of apartheid seemed impossible, perhaps, but we never stopped. We never gave up. Boycotts, divestment campaigns, sanctions, writings, teaching, advocating, and more, all made a difference. We meet this evening at a time when every day brings news of some new challenge to our belief that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. When every day brings news of some new assault on the institutions and values we cherish. This country, my country, the country I have come to love so deeply feels different and I am pulled back to that aching loneliness of 1968. What had drawn me to this country? As it has been for millions and millions of immigrants before me, my absorption into the United States has been demanding and exhausting. And yet I have been able to accomplish here what I believe, what I know, I could never have accomplished anywhere else. I have lived the promise of America, and it is that promise that drew me here. This evening with you, I can look back on the distance I have come, but I cannot rest. I renew the oath of citizenship I took. I hereby declare on oath that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I do so strengthened by the words of Robert Kennedy I heard 52 years ago. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. I believe in this country. I believe in its values. 
I believe in its institutions, and I still believe in its promise. It takes belief and courage to shape our future. And I celebrate you, lawyers and judges and law firms and businesses and citizens and immigrants for your insistence that equality under law remain the defining gene of the DNA of the United States of America. And may each of you stand up for an ideal or strike out against injustice, and together we can tear down the mightiest walls of resistance and oppression. Thank you.